Barcelona gets some penguins. Gideon Live uses all the threads. There's a new Raspberry Pi in town. And YouTube? Wow, it did a thing. That's right. It's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. Welcome back to another Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. I don't know why I'm saying it like that, Pedro. Maybe because you're back, man. I missed you, buddy. What, what's going on with you? Because we're just about to sit back, relax, back, and baby. take a look at all the uh, things that we found going on in the world of Linux land. But before we do that, man, t- tell me about that trip. You went to uh, you went across the channel, and they let you back in, which was the surprising oh, yes. part. <laughs> yeah, they did. Uh, even the... Um security person at the airport as you're going through the border you got to show him your id he lifted the thing looked at my picture then looked at me again it's like can you undo your ponytail it's like i can oh, okay all right. oh, 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 were you like licking your lips oh, man i would have been licking my lips and... <laughs> no i just pulled out the thing it's like dead oh yeah no that's fine okay <laughs> all right <laughs> that's cool man so everything's sorted we are back for another week of just Indeed. like i said man cool stuff we found i didn't have a I, i'm kind of not dreading or exciting if you follow me on the social medias we're doing some new things in the studio adding extra extra nightmare fuel this is one of the pieces of equipment mm. that Ooh. is going in when some other things arrive hopefully friday and it's like can i live stream doing this it's like nobody wants to watch that but I will throw a camera up on our ceiling because we have rails and stuff and you will get a time lapse of me pulling everything apart, assembling things and probably throwing something at some point. It, it will uh, <laughs> uh, it might it'll happen. just be that one frame of something blurry flying over. <laughs> it'll be a UFO slash streetlight. You're like, oh, it's Bigfoot. I knew it. I knew it. So uh, check this business out. While we jump right into this, coming from the register, did you, all right, okay, all right, what what is this? It's the Kernel Mailing List Archives, lived on one PC, one broken PC, to which I ask you, Pedro, were were you really surprised? Not really, considering this is Linux we're talking about, we all have that one netbook laptop that just sits in a corner running sometimes that holds some files which may or may not be important but uh yeah this uh jesper spans uh actually took it to the next level because he was the sole person barring the indiana university mirror uh who was hosting the linux kernel mailing list archives it's like all the archives all the, the old stuff it was on that one pc and then he got a bit of a flood because there was a power cut and he had the washing machine going and the water kept pumping, but it wasn't draining. So it had a bit of a flood at his place and it caught the server and it damaged the motherboard and so everything went down. Everything was on fire. Well, underwater, as the case may be. <laughs> is everything sorted now? I mean, did they go to... Um, oh, it is. Yeah. yeah that's you know at first yeah it like, took you, uh couldn't believe 30 couldn't minutes believe it. or something yeah but i immediately was like you've done stuff like this so don't even start in on this guy <laughs> it's like yeah fair enough i shouldn't shouldn't say anything especially when it comes to redundancy hopefully uh that will no longer be an issue so mm-hmm. yeah, so good on that glad it's resolved but uh guy we know uh actually we're, we're Better friends with this punching bag, but uh, yeah, yeah we had his punching bag on the show at one yeah, point. Was he was also there, bag. but yeah, yeah, that introduced us to him, <laughs> the, the creator of Solus. Ike uh, <laughs> has demanded Discord. Discord. Uh, yes, uh, he instigated some of it too. Uh, he made a suggestion on the uh, Discord uh, improvement uh, feedback page thingy. And, uh, he says that currently the desktop app will forcibly prevent itself from working. If it detects a new update, that's true. We've all been there. We've started discord. It's like, Oh, there's an update. You got to download either the deb or the tar.xz. But let's say you have a distribution, which is not actually based on Ubuntu or any other previously existing distribution. Uh, which doesn't use Debs, uh, and they have their own packaging system and everything mm-hmm. else. Maybe 
maybe you'd like a way to let your users keep on using Discord mm -hmm. when there is an update before, like, the Friday re repo sync that uh, Ike mentions in the post. That, that's well, what I was uh, going to say, man. Isn't that kind of one of the issues? Is like, this really forces us to double up our efforts because... Yeah, and it forces distro maintainers or repo maintainers or packagers or whatever mm -hmm. to be on the ball whenever there's an update so people can keep on using Discord. But then, again, I can see the point of not locking people out of that glorified browser window that Discord runs on. But it is a good thing to have. It's expected functionality. But again, it is a glorified browser window, so if you just open Discord in an actual browser, you could probably work around that till the repo syncs. I think a lot of people kind of said that. They're like, wait a minute, you use the desktop client? You can just launch it <laughs> in a browser. I've never yeah. noticed it because every time it does update, it's like, yo, you need to update. And I click OK, and I'm just running 1710 dot whatever it is this week. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. That, that would be a good thing. I didn't know, Pedro, that it didn't let you log in unless you updated, because I've always updated. Yeah. That was a TIL on that mm -hmm. one. Yeah, mm. so it, it, we don't see it as much because you run Ubuntu, I run Ubuntu. But if you are running Solus on your system and you do need the Discord app, say, for the global uh, press-to-talk functionality or the separate... Um, uh, the separate audio stream, if you, in case you want to futz with that. Yes, that is probably something annoying, especially if you're running a distro like Solus or Slackware or really anything else that doesn't use Debs. So, yeah. That's the thing. Maybe I didn't see anybody getting back to him directly from Discord. So, no. I don't know. Maybe they'll get it sorted just in time. So, uh, hey, man. We win some, we lose some, because uh, he was at Munich, kind of a tapped mm -hmm. out analytics, and it was due to politics, too, not really because things weren't working, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Barcelona. How, how do you say Barcelona? You're a oh, Spaniard. Yes. <laughs> Barcelona. Barcelona. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they got a little bit of a anti-Microsoft, pro-Linux, open sourcey love, man. Well, I'm not entirely sure it's anti-Microsoft. It's more anti-having to pay a lot of money to renew licenses and whatnot. They're uh, doing this in phases, as you should. Uh, first, they're replacing Microsoft Office with LibreOffice in all of the um, official uh, systems. And then they plan on moving to a Linux distro, which can run everything and there's speculation that it may be Ubuntu. There really hasn't been any sort of confirmation, but uh, people are pointing at Ubuntu and it seems to be the most likely candidate. Uh, and that is a good thing, especially when you take Munich as an example, because Munich, they developed their own distro, Limux. And that was like the one big technical sticking, uh, sticking point was the um, the lack of support because... Yeah, it was a custom distro. You had to do everything by hand in order to upgrade, in order to update, whatever. So if you are using Ubuntu, you don't really have to worry about that. And push comes to shove, you can just pay Canonical to undo whatever screw-ups you may have done. So that's that's a plus. It makes sense. And I definitely believe that anything the government does should be open source, period. Even if it was some yes. closed source software, all that should be available. And um, it looks like they're going to be pretty smooth. They're probably going to run into some issues with mm -hmm. uh, LibreOffice, like everyone does. But yes, it's getting better mm -hmm. every day. And it's good that they chose that over. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I could see them using, like, attempting to use Google Docs. But then again. Unless they're deploying, actively deploying Chromebooks to everyone to replace Windows laptops or something. Eh, Google Docs probably going to be a bit of a push otherwise, but yeah, no, LibreOffice right now for most stuff, it works. It's still going to have issues with like other municipalities uh, that are not using LibreOffice and maybe they have this heavily formatted uh, Excel spreadsheet that's not going to look or work properly in LibreOffice Calc. So that's something to consider. Hmm. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, 
I got a little excited. Uh, a little bit? <laughs> a little bit. Because I just randomly typed All in... All 16 threads? Randomly typed into Google. Because, I'm sorry, we use KDN Live because I had to let go of OpenShot. And I was OpenShot Zealot, OpenShot Supporter. Gave him all the love it could. It just got to the point to where it was too much of a tinker toy and a hassle, and uh, I've learned to embrace the KD in life. But Melt, mm -hmm. Melt's good with four cores. Melt's all right with eight cores. And, well, I should say threads. You throw 16 threads at Melt, Melt pops a glue stick in its mouth and goes, I don't know, man. I mean, uh, maybe over here. Just typed into Google. It's like, does anybody have any tricks? And yeah, I know the trick on the render thing when it says use that. It, yeah, it's going to use 16 threads and like five of them that'll use 2% of. I found this and this is, you know, this is not brand new, but uh, 20 days ago, it's absolutely a thing. Mm -hmm. KDN Live multi-render, a bash script enabling multi-threaded video rendering for KDN Live. And it's dead simple to set up and get it to use. I mean, you render out a script. You throw this in, you tell it how many threads you want it to work. It's going to spool up that many instances and boom. I mean, it gets done yeah. with a quickness. So I tested it out. I even went so far as get ready, Jordan incoming. Uh, there he is. <laughs> I tested it out on our 1700, not the X, just regular 1700. Cut our render time in half for last week's episode of LGC Weekly. Uh, it was about 48, that's good. 48 minutes, and that's around 20 gigs of data on compressed video and audio. Cut it to 28 minutes by running this. So, yeah. Yeah. Words of words, words of caution, though. <laughs> because I almost took our render box, Tipsy Danger, down rendering that very video because I wasn't paying attention because we do this show and, um, Linux Game Cast weekly at 720p60. So I set it to six mm -hmm. threads. I have uh, 16 gigajoules of memory in this box. That's fine. It didn't think twice. It used all 16 threads. It used about 11 gigajoules of RAM. That was great. That video that I recorded was at UHD 3840 by 2160 at 60 frames a second. <laughs> Sorry there. So I had to how cut, big cut was it? Um... It wasn't necessarily that big. It was the problem with I set it to use all six threads rendering that out, and it immediately ate all of the memory and all of the swap. <laughs> so things got a little chuggy, and praise Flying Spaghetti Monster, I had, I had a terminal open focused because I was able to control mm -hmm. shift T, kill all melt. And granted, this process took like three and a half minutes, 100% swap usage, 100% memory usage. It soldiered through, and we were able to get it done. Then I went back and reduced that down. Um, it is a to very... To be fair, he does warn. He does warn the GitHub page that uh, you got to be careful. You can tell it to use as many threads as you have available, but it's just going to copy everything to RAM and run basically on RAM with all the CPU using 100% all the time. So yeah, you're probably going to crash something if you don't have enough RAM. I'm just saying, if you got 1,700, 16 gigs of RAM and you're doing 720p video, six is a magic number there. Uh, stick mm -hmm. with that. So Core Boot 4.7, got some release notes. It's doing something new and fancy this week, or is this more the same? Well, it is more of the same in the way that it supports a lot more uh, chipsets and whatnot. So Core Boot, it's uh, that open source, but not exactly libre, uh, alternative to UEFI, EFI, basically a little bit of uh, firmware replacement, which takes care of booting your machine. And it had very limited support for just a couple of... Um, Intel chipsets and a couple of AMD older AMD chipsets. Now, though, uh, version 4.7 comes out, uh, and since the last update in April 2017, according to the post, they had 150 authors committing a total of uh, 20, uh, 2,573 patches. So that is pretty good. And with that comes a whole bunch of new hardware support, including perhaps the biggest one of all, uh, a load of 
new Intel chipsets. It's uh, everything from Chromebooks to embedded devices to uh, regular laptops that you could just buy off the shelf. Everything now supports Core Boot, which if you're worried about a little something called the management engine, uh, you Core Boot just uh, shoves that off to the side and says, no, I'll take care of that. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so it is pretty good. Th this is an advantage if you're worried about the government coming in and stealing your data. Is, is that it? Mm-hmm. Uh, stealing your boot time data, yes. <laughs> All right. That's the that's a neat tool. I'm guessing this is primarily for laptops, so right. Yeah, mostly laptops because laptops are what most people use, whether we like it or not. That's the big selling point, especially Chromebooks nowadays. There's a lot of Chromebook sales happening. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, just having that support is a big step up. They even have support for the... Uh, excavator series apus the stony ridge amd chipset okay so if you happen to have one of those laptops which were like two of them i think <laughs> uh you could now run core boot right on uh and you, you could probably also run a what is it a photo shoots and one yeah hey man we're talking about this well, coming from could. yeah our linux <laughs> uh reddit.com you know this business all of this in our show notes screenshots of photoshop cc 2018 64 bit on the linux this this is a uh, terrifying petrifying uh, a little bit stupefying and for me this falls under the um 2000 percent neat pedro but uh kind of no thank you because like right now there's not really any gpu support plugin support's going to be hit or miss because then again this is one and then again we do also have mm -hmm. the ever elusive support support and i i don't know am i alone there, there's a hierarchy of i try to avoid wine as much as possible um but something like photoshop i just i, I wouldn't trust to be reliable in any way shape form or fashion even because let's face it running natively on a windows box or a mac box it's not entirely stable there either nope no it is not <laughs> but it is uh well it's good to see uh that the wine developers uh the progress that they have made is actually enabling some people to do some basic photoshop uh creative suite 2018 on 64 bit uh just letting them run that on their linux boxes now they do suggest in the post that you use pirate portable builds but uh, well they say it's, they're not recommended because you never really know what's inside and that's actually a good thing it's like don't pirate your software if you have a license and you have to use it uh and you're running linux it's like what exactly went wrong with your life and at what point did you decide that that was a good alternative but hey Maybe you are in that situation and you really want to uh, run Photoshop and Wine, but it's it's still flaky, very flaky. Tr trying to figure out, because this is 2018 and you can buy a 16-threaded CPU for under $300. Unfortunately, the RAM's still mm -hmm. stupid expensive and getting higher. Mm -hmm. Why not just run this in a VM? Yeah, yeah, that's actually the better alternative, just pass uh, your uh, USB drawing tablet or your U the USB touch functionality of your screen to the VM. It's easy enough to do. There are tutorials for QMU. I think both VMware and VirtualBox just let you do right-click pass a USB device. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just do that instead. I don't know. Send your hate mail to us. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback mm -hmm. on that idea because I'm sure we're both wrong. G guess what? Sometimes people are wrong in the internet. And I'm sure I'm about to step mm -hmm. into it right now uh, because Thunderbird <laughs> has gotten work on improving its interface. You too can take part in this survey. Um, they talk about their latest redesign, what they're doing, how it's coming together, some of the ideas. They want some feedback. And... That's all well and good. A couple of pictures in here. But I do want to say this, because uh, I, I do believe us diehard Thunderbird users, we, we kind of know 
that it's a dying product. I'm not just talking about Thunderbird itself, but the whole idea, the whole need for a standalone male client is kind of going away. And I personally don't believe that, you know, any amount of UX redesign is going to revive just that dwindling need for a standalone email client. Now, Pedro, correct me if I'm right. I kind of feel like moving stuff around and redesigning this will both anger and confuse the current user base that right now have a very legitimate like, laser focused use case for the product. But I would suggest this. Mm -hmm. Thunderbird, Mozilla, could you please update the spell check in Thunderbird to include words from the 20th century? Please. Yeah, those dictionaries need a bit of an update. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, the uh, the monorail guys. You may know them. They uh, pushed out a tweet a while back that uh, I think it was OMG Ubuntu that picked it up. And it's like, oh, this could be the new default theme for Thunderbird. And apparently they're actively pushing for that to happen. And yes, it looks more quote unquote modern, whatever that means. Uh, and it has a... Um, there's one thing I don't like about this particular theme, which is just how spaced out everything is. I am one of those diehard um, Thunderbird users. Mm -hmm. I have a theme which uh, is actually, if you go to the full themes in the Thunderbird extras, yeah, there's actually a... Um, that, that was funny, apparently. Uh, <laughs> there's actually a... Um... Listen, man, I'm just going to say that was an appropriate response to anyone who hears. <laughs> I, I use a Thunderbird theme. You should be laughed at. You should feel shame. <laughs> it's a compact theme. It actually respects the GTK theme, whatever you have it set to. But it's it makes everything much less spaced out. There's a whole lot less padding. Uh, between all the elements in the UI, so that's good enough for me. This, this, I just feel like it's wasting space. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time looking at it. I use Thunderbird as is genuinely the first or second thing that gets launched every morning along with Steam, Discord, IRC. And that's how, when we have so many email accounts, you know, with our just show personal mm -hmm. accounts, feedback, mail accounts, and all that fun stuff. I need it. It works. And I know a lot of people use it for calendar. Well, a lot of people. Strider is the one person left in North America that uses it for calendar. Um, good on them. Best of luck. I mean, even if you change it too much, make it where you can kind of change it back. Don't make it too confusing. And I think one thing secretly a lot of people still use Thunderbird for, and they don't realize they do, is for their, it's their notepad. I, I, yeah. I, I catch myself <laughs> just open up new comp email yep, com composing a new email a lot just like oh, I need to type something out real quick da, 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 boom post it alright uh, before we get into the slice of pie I just wanted to give uh, Quark a mention no we're not talking about DS9 we're talking about the world's first offline search engine for the internet cannot stop us from learning are your children learning the whole thing I don't know open genus world's first Offline search engine is a offline code search engine presented by Open Genius Foundation. You can now search the code for any algorithm and all that. It's a little above my pay grade, but it looked like a neat piece of kit, man. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, if you've ever been stuck working on something and the, the internet goes down and you really need to google or stack overflow to be a bit more precise about that one specific bit of whatever language you're using that lets you do something well that that's the situation that they have in mind now how often that happens kind of really comes down to what kind of work you do or what kind of project you're into but it is well it is uh, offline stack overflow hmm. well it's not necessarily yeah. anything wrong with that no at the end of the day right no, no, and that, that could, could be the thing, man. I, I know a lot of companies and businesses are a little upset, like, but, well, employees, because Stack Overflow goes down. I was like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, that, that's the new compiling <laughs> XKCD. <laughs> Get back to work and with all that. But hey, you know, with your support, this show will never go down. And, you know, if you want to help us keep doing that, head over to linuxgamecast.com, tap the support button, forward slash support. If you got an extra buck laying around, it'd be awesome to consider supporting 
our little horse and buggy show. It keeps us ad free. You get some cool rewards in return at Patreon. That's that. Mm-hmm. And uh, everyone shopping with their affiliate links, you are da, D A real MVPs, because I wrote in the notes the T H A, and Google Docs corrected that to da. So <laughs> that doesn't cost you a dime. You're going to buy the stuff anyway. We get a little bit of a wish list. Uh, New egg, humble PayPal, man. Sometimes you're just like, yo, that's not my thing. I'll just give you cash on the barrel. That's one way to do it. And we support not one, but two failed cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making this possible. And we're going to be doing more stuff. Plans are being made. You're going to be sick of us in the upcoming months. But Pedro, we need to thank a couple of the new beautiful party patrons this week. Yes, we do. We have Mike W. and Christopher C., which are new Patreons. Welcome. Thank you very, very, very much. Don't forget to sync up uh, your discords or whatever uh, rewards you uh, signed up for. I'm sorry. In advance. <laughs> and we have a returning Patreon, Matt C. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know why you left in the first place. Hopefully it was just a credit card hiccup. No, Everything's pretty, doing okay. No, he, he said Appreciate it was, it. It was 100% your fault. Okay, all right, that's fair enough. <laughs> well then, uh, see you later, because <laughs> I'm back now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, yeah. Again, man, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, everyone in our Discord right now because they were the ones hanging out, keeping us up to date mm-hmm. and all that business. But as you just saw, it is time for that slice of pie, and it looks like it's got a little. M- is it an M M&M and M or the Skittles? I don't know. That's a lot of pie, man. It's an M M&M. and M. That's that's one of those peanut M and Ms. The good ones. Oh, okay. I'm going to get so much hate for that. <laughs> Starting off with all right. The first one is go for it. Go for a it. A new raspberry pie. Yeah, an actually new raspberry pie. Uh, well, it's based on the raspberry pie. Z- oh zero. come on! Oh, this please. isn't a new yes. raspberry pie. This is a raspberry pie with a body <laughs> kit. Yeah, basically, it is the Raspberry Pi Zero W H, which, uh, what does the H stand for? That's a very good question. Uh, what does it have that's different from this uh, Raspberry Pi Zero W? The GPIO header. Mm-hmm. That's what it does. It, you you have the GPIO pins back. That's awesome. Now, I get some of the complaints uh, because... Yeah, the Raspberry Pi Zero, because it was very thin, it was very small, you could fit it into smaller spaces, much lower footprint. Uh, so, yeah, that could be a concern. But if you still need that uh, small footprint, the Raspberry Pi Zero W isn't going anywhere. You just get the Zero WH if you do want the GPI header instead of just having to There is something everything. to be said, man, for having professionally soldered, ready-to-go GPIO pins. Out of the box. Yeah, yeah. So it's there. If you want to play with it up next is, I don't know, man, how do I want to put this? This is really neat, but it doesn't explain why. This is one of my thought projects. It's like, I, I really admire what's going on. It's the Kindleberry Pi Zero W. <laughs> That's what I'm calling it, the okay. Kindleberry Pie Zero W. Try not to think of dingleberries, everyone, now that you are. <laughs> um, I mean, listen, this is neat. It's using an old Kindle Raspberry Pi Zero W mm-hmm. battery pack, a keyboard, router, and adapters and cables, to which I'll reply. I mean, this is a neat project, but only if you like challenging yourself not to lose things. Um <laughs> Because it's, uh, why would you want to use your uh, Kindle as a screen, though? I mean, it's supposed to be like the paper thing. I don't, I don't, I don't get, uh, okay, it's neat. I will give it that, but I don't get this one. Mm. They're, they're... <laughs> I'm not the only one, apparently. <laughs> Kindle's, uh, that, 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 that's like the universal sign for, I don't know, man, but... They're cheap. You, you can get like a jail. Yeah. He does make a point that you want to make sure you have a jailbreakable Kindle, one of the older ones, a couple of quid mm-hmm. on the uh, eBay's, 
And then again, they're e-paper too. So it, a full charge is going to last you until the eventual heat death of the universe. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I have the Gen 1 Kindle, the one with the like free Wikipedia access for life. I think mm-hmm. I've charged that thing three times in what, a decade? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there is that advantage. But again, why would you want to use it as Hey, don't screen? know, man. Listen, that's like, you, you know, tablets have on screen keyboards, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Or you can get a keyboard <laughs> case if you're feeling real adventurous. I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe you have a really good idea of why that's a good idea or maybe a more insane idea and you want to tell us about it. How can they do that? Well, you can do that in a multitude of different ways, but the way that you're guaranteed to have us see it and most likely feature it right here is by going to linuxgamecast.com. You hit the contact button or just add forward slash contact and you fill out the form. Make sure to pick LWDW so you can send us some feedback right here. There are other options. Feel free to explore them. We love those other options very much as well. Well, those options um, are good, man. They're also very funny. Well, they are. (laughs) They're hilarious is what they are, Pedro. We we even had... Just sometimes it's perplexing because we also do a gaming show on Saturday if you want to come watch that Nightmare Fuel. Is... Cause we try to make it very clear. We need three keys because there's three of us on the Saturday show. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, a single key is useless. So we got to write it, but usually we just ignore it. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody sent us two. <laughs> and it was really awesome the, the way that they phrase it. It's like, oh, here's two keys. Uh, if you only need the one, feel free to give the other one away. You did not read what we wrote. No, I forwarded it to Pedro because if I were to reply, it was like, <laughs> what is it like to be in the 21st century and not be able to read? Um, <laughs> that, that's why I don't handle our PR stuff. So coming in first, 1000 by Pandy to, I'm going to read this. I, I was actually made aware of this this morning by reading this mm-hmm. in our email. Uh Were you guys affected by the new YouTube policies? Question mark. Will this finally spawn a real competitor? I guess competitor spell, right? I think it will have a chilling effect on Linux YouTubers. Um, In order, were you guys? No, surprisingly, we were not. I went and checked. Even though we're like in the middle of the month, uh, we currently have 93,000 minutes of views in the last 30 days. Mm -hmm. Bonus soda. Uh... Will this finally spawn a real competitor? The only competitor? No, probably not. Uh, will this a no. chilling effect on YouTubers? Okay, if you don't know what's going on, maybe you were like me this morning. I was like, really? What? Because YouTube didn't tell us anything, which ultimately turned out to be a good thing. Mm-hmm. If you have less than a thousand subscribers or people watch less than something like 4,000, I'm making up yeah. numbers right now 4000 so. hours over the uh past 12 months 12 months then they're going to yeah. demonetize your channel I'm the wrong person to talk to because I got into the YouTube monetization 2010 when you had to apply it took like 6 months and if you were lucky they let you in then they just started making it rain for everyone basically mm-hmm. you just had to create a YouTube mm-hmm. channel and you would get monetized And this is only going to affect, they said, like, mostly this is going to affect channels that are making less than $100 a year. Yeah. So, mm, I don't think it's going to have a chilling effect. uh, It's less about, no, it's less about the impact that it actually has, but more of how they're they're doing it. Because that's usually the way that it goes with these things. It's kind of like the Patreon thing. The Patreon thing, uh, I think it was Jim Sterling that, uh, yeah, it was Jim Sterling that made this very good example. The, when Patreon introduced like the whole new way that they were going to charge people for the uh, costs of things, it was going to impact the like one dollar Patreons the most severely, and this is very similar because it's the smaller channels which are going to see the biggest impact i got that email from google saying yeah no your channel is being demonetized this is your 30-day notice that your youtube partner program termination is inbound uh, admittedly i don't really pay too much attention to my personal youtube channel there's a couple of videos there there's one that has the most views and that's it but uh no it's um it is 
basically going to curb anyone who's trying to start a YouTube channel. Uh, you're not going to get monetized for a long, long time unless you get lucky, really lucky, and you hit those 1,000 subscribers or 4,000 hours of whatever really, really fast. Are you accusing YouTube of only wanting to put monetization towards videos that are good? Yeah, I'm cu accusing YouTube of uh, making big channels get bigger and smaller channels basically disappearing off the face of YouTube. Uh, so the, I, I'm playing yeah. Flying Spaghetti Monsters Advocate right now, ladies and gentlemen. Um, mm -hmm. Spare the hate mail on this one. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you, YouTube is preventing people from uploading videos? Nope. No? So, so I, I can, I, I can, I, I can still videos. take advantage of them hosting my videos for free without any cost yes. to me, but they're not going to pay me for that privilege anymore. Yeah. Huh. Yep. We should be outraged. <laughs> Get the pitchforks. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it doesn't really, for us specifically, it doesn't really affect us, but it's like the implications of what this will bring. Because bigger channels are just going to get bigger because they have less competition now. And smaller channels, well, they're not going to get as much uh, money back from advertising that will let them improve on their content, maybe do some new things. That is going to be the big one. Well, it'll be interesting to see how, how it plays out. Again... Full disclosure doesn't affect us, but you're like, I, I know somebody's like, of course it wouldn't affect you, but you were talking to people who's like, oh, right, we have a YouTube channel, right? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we use it for free offsite video storage. That That's pretty much it. Now, we are consistent. I mean, we put out like five videos a, a week, or really, we put out the podcast. We just put the video out for the live show, and people like to go back and rewatch that. Uh, I, I guess if you're getting into it, I mean, you can always go to Twitch. No one blows up Twitch. You know, yeah. you become a Twitch partner. They only take half. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't and know. And it's actually much easier to become a Twitch partner now than it was a couple of years ago. So, yeah. Twitch is, if there is going to be a real competitor, quote unquote, there won't be. There will uh, be. What Twitch people, I'll tell you. probably man. the one... The real competitor to YouTube, like ironically, is going to be created, is being created by Linus, not that Linus, the other Linus, which is not the, the one that one. you think yeah. that I think mm. that you think. No, I'm from Linus Tech to set kid. Mm. He's not a kid. I think he's older mm. than I am. Uh, he's creating a system called Flowplane. You don't hear people talking about it. That's 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 gonna hurt YouTube when that thing goes live. Um, okay. Enough of that. Enough of that. Uh, we talked about Meltdown last week, and we talked about a script that you could download off the internet and run as root. And that, that we highly encourage everyone to live dangerously here at Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday and do that at least once a month. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I saw last week's show because, you know, I wasn't on it. Uh, and uh, thank you, Jill. Thank you very much for filling in for me. Uh, and yes, that uh, that script got a lot of people saying, yeah, uh, no, there are lists out there. And Matt seems to be one of those people. Uh, he says, I saw that script. Aha. Uh -huh. I said, nope. No, thanks. There is an official list from Intel if you want to know if your Intel processor is affected by Meltdown slash Spectre. Uh, spoiler, it is. If it was made in the past 15 years, it is. Um, not sure about other manufacturers uh, having an official list, but I run Intel on my current system. Yeah. Yeah, no. Outside of the Atom, like the 32-bit Atom that you saw in the first uh, iterations of the netbooks back in the day, every single Intel processor is affected by either Meltdown or Spectre in any of the variants that are currently out there. So, yeah. It's... <laughs> you don't that, need a script to do that. <laughs> that. That's the thing, man. And if you're dealing with like Cabby Lake and older man, that performance hit is turning out to be real. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's hitting Team Red, Team Blue, ARM that does uh, branch predictions. Some of the new sauce for that, not Raspberry Pis, because they're dumb. We love them, though. Sometimes dumb's good. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
Yeah, it's a very simple equation. If after 95, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so patch it when it comes out. My, people are push, pushing out the micro code. I know Intel has, maybe AMD will. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of me says it's kind of a lot to do about nothing because the chances of this ever affecting you in any real way, I know, I know somebody's going to find a way to exploit it right now and just well there were there, that was the thing with like the difference between meltdown and specter is that meltdown there were proof of concept exploits that you could run and they proved just how bad the exploit was and how bad it could affect you specter on the other hand that's a bit more iffy and uh i think it was amd that said that their processors like our horizons uh i have a near zero probability of being affected because of how it does the speculative um, memory allocation. And yeah, I kind of believe them. Mm -hmm. I have no reason not to. <laughs> okay, beautiful people. That's going to do it for this week's Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. I want to thank everyone for showing up. It's been awesome. It's been real. And uh, we're going to show some uh, appreciations by saying, hey, we want to put your names in our credits. Yes. See, uh, you have the Linux Gamecast original series, and then you have Fatten. You got Old Man Van, you Old have Man Pedro. Man. Last week it was named yes. Canadian. And you, Sean Rumble. And then you, you guys, show up Executive right here. Producers. We you can be one of those names. Look at those beautiful people. Mm -hmm. All of them. Beautiful, beautiful people. They're Even gorgeous. Pizza Dude. <laughs> and Pizza Dude, I mean, uh, you got to take that on a week week basis, man. Yeah. <laughs> But he's uh, actually one of the oldest uh, Shadow Realm members. He's been around for a long, long time, and he just does not let go. <laughs> no, no. 101 episodes. We're coming up on two years. It's been fun. Blam. Ooh.